If a zombie apocalypse finally allowed you to take time off from your soul-sucking dead-end job, what would you do? It's just your average, everyday, world-ending epidemic of undead cannibals. Only this time with a twist. Our hero finally has time to breathe for the first time in over a year, and he's dead set on enjoying it, even if it means putting himself and others in mortal danger. However, little does he realize the drudgery of the old world didn't actually die. It just changed shape. And if he's not careful, he risks falling right back into the same pattern that made life miserable for so long. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the monotony of human existence in ZOM 100, Bucket List of the Dead. Akira is a working stiff. The last year has seen him pretty much living at his office without any time off to speak of, and it's clearly taken a toll on his mental state. So much so, that upon Upon walking up on one of his neighbors chowing down on human flesh and subsequently being chased by a shrieking horde of ravenous zombies, the first thing that crosses his mind is that he might be late for work. However, after losing his pursuers behind a fenced off section of the rooftop, Akira is suddenly struck by the realization that human society, at least in Tokyo, has totally collapsed. The city's in ruins and crawling with inhuman monsters, and many, if not all, of the people people he knows and loves have either perished or joined the ranks of the undead. Most importantly, that figure likely includes his co-workers and head manager. And you know what that means. Today, I don't need to come into work. <laughs> yeah! Silver lining right? And the good news doesn't end there. Well, Kira also finally manages to get a text back from his co-worker crush, Otori. And just to add to the dreamlike nature of this entire episode, she wants him to come over. Romantic implications aside, the fact he got a text back from anyone is a major win. I mean, for starters, it's evidence there's still people out there capable of texting. But this also shows the cellular networks are still functional, and probably a lot more than than that. Whatever the case, before we go hauling at through the corpse-filled streets on our bicycle like a living meme, we should try reaching out to other people we know who live both inside and outside the city. It's possible this is some kind of localized emergency, in which case all we have to worry about in the short term is finding a way out of town. Of course, it'd also be worth calling both 119 and 110 to see if Japan's emergency services are still responding, and if so, whether they have any specific advice or information that can help us stay alive. For example, there could be military safe zones set up throughout the city taking in survivors. Or they might tell us receiving invitations from your love interests is the first sign of infection. Speaking of which, anything we can learn about the zombies will be of great use to us. How are they created? Can they be killed? And if so, how? Are there multiple kinds running around like left for dead? All of this would be good to know before we go out there. Luckily, it seems various arms of the news media, for whatever it's worth, are still broadcasting despite the outbreak. By the sound of it, they have some pretty useful insights to share concerning the undead, none of which Akira bothers to ask about while dropping by his neighbor's apartment. Instead, he treats this whole situation like a snowstorm and checks to see if they want anything from 7-Eleven. I guess, uh, a cup ramen if you don't mind? And fruit if you can possibly get some. Okay! Yes, comfort food and highly perishable items like fruit are certainly worth your unstable neighbor's life. Dirtbags didn't even try talking him out of it. As for Akira, he should have at least tried working out some sort of trade, maybe even for weapons he could use if things get crazy. Obviously, being this is Japan, I wouldn't expect him to pull a styrog out from under the couch cushions, but a few kitchen knives or even a baseball bat are certainly better than a fist when you're up against a bunch of brainless biters, not to mention the possibility of running into a little competition out on his supply run. First things first, our guy still has to drop in on his co-worker to profess his undying love now that every HR person on the planet Earth has likely been eaten alive. Sadly, it turns out their company director beat him to it. Although, judging by the man's shambling movements and vacant expression, I get the feeling she'll be back on the market soon enough. For now, she just needs 
needs Akira to take out the reanimated corpse of her former lover. Figures, right? Still, I'm not sure why Otori would wait God knows how long for him to pedal across town when it seems she can handle herself just fine. Told me that you'd leave your wife! <laughs> you said it! You liar! Hey, look on the bright side. His wife is probably dead too. Things only go from bad to worse once Otori begins showing the same set of symptoms. Seeing the bite wounds on her extremities, Akira puts two and two together and hits the road before she can share the love. Well, that was fun. The only upside from this encounter is that we've seen firsthand the zombies can be killed through conventional means, and we've got a pretty good idea of how the contagion is spread. Of course, we shouldn't assume the mode of transmission is limited to bites alone. Contact with the infected should be avoided as much as possible, and that means keeping our excursions down to a bare minimum. In that case, we probably should have come home with more than just a single bag of groceries we'll be giving up anyway. Fortunately, it seems our useless neighbors already got themselves eaten, so I guess that means more for us. As for Akira, what started off as the perfect day ended with a feeling of utter hopelessness. But just as he's about to fall into despair, he decides to compile a list of things to do before becoming Zombie Chow. And while it falls well short of the hundred mentioned in the title, the exercise works wonders to raise his spirits. In reality, some kind of planning activity is essential in survival situations, as it's proven to help keep your mind at ease and focused on something other than how screwed you are. That being said, many of Akira's bucket list items come off as colossal waste of time and effort. Don't get me wrong, cleaning your room and finding a faster means of transportation are hugely important. That much clutter is the mental health equivalent of chain smoking, and you never know when you might need to make a quick getaway in a world where 99% of the population wants to eat you. But dyeing your hair and spray painting your face on a skyscraper probably could have waited until after we had our situation a bit more squared away. And then there's his trip to the grocery store. I could never fault someone for wanting to enjoy steak and lobster one last time. But we need to be using our limited inventory space to haul back as many canned goods and non-perishables as possible. Eventually, the power will go out, and with it, our ability to keep food frozen. When that happens, we'll want to have well-stocked supply of food and water already in place. Besides, there may be a point where circumstances force us to take this show on the road, in which case, we probably won't have room for an ice chest. The good news is the store shelves seem totally packed, meaning the overwhelming majority of Tokyo's residents are either dead or undead. On one hand, we won't have to worry too much about duking it out with our fellow survivors over rapidly dwindling food supplies. But on the other hand, it means we are beyond outnumbered against the zombies. Knowing this, it'd probably be a good idea to beef up our defenses, both around our lair and while we're out in the field. My first thought would be crafting bite protection on my legs and arms using the tried and true method of duct tape and magazines. It's not very original or stylish, but who exactly is left to impress these days anyway? As for our head and face, we'll want to upgrade our simple brain bucket to a full coverage motorcycle helmet. I'm honestly not sure why he would have gone with anything else in this situation. Once that's taken care of, we need to think about weapons. Baseball bats, fire axes, and kitchen knife spears will certainly put down the odd shambler, but it'd be nice to have something ranged to put a few down fast and give ourselves a fighting chance against any bandits out there. As I mentioned previously, firearms are not nearly as common over here, but Japanese law does allow for the ownership of air rifles and shotguns given the right paperwork. At least for now, Akira isn't having much trouble getting around, so it'd be worth making a trip over to Shibuya Firearms in hopes their shelves are still as well stocked as everyone else's. Obviously, we'll want to use our shotguns sparingly to avoid attracting unwanted attention, but the air rifles could prove extremely useful for picking off small hordes around areas of interest, provided they can do the trick, that is. We'll definitely want to test them out on some of our rooftop zombies before we try them out on a raid. And speaking of testing, another one of Akira's bucket list items involves acquiring large amounts of fireworks that we could repackage into more practical 
mobile devices. It'll take some experimenting to get the mixture right, but I think it's worth a try. Never know when you might need to blow sh** up. Eventually, Akira caps off his first batch of bucket list items with a solo cookout, only to wind up running back to the store for a new bottle of steak sauce. Unlike before, however, he's not alone. And it's here, he nearly gets his skull caved in by love interest number two. All he needs now is a way to demonstrate value to this mystery woman before she disappears for good. And what better way to do that than by risking his life protecting some helpless moron out in the street? Unfortunately for our hero, things don't go quite as planned. Yeah, probably because you went out there with nothing but plastic squirt bottles, you fuck dunce. Good thing Shizuka came prepared. <laughs> Glad to see at least someone out here knows what they're doing. Not only does this chick know her way around a nightstick, but it seems she's observed the zombies long enough to know they prioritize sound over sight, which she demonstrates by drawing a second one away using a personal alarm device. This, of course, makes Akira's use of a chopper a huge liability and explains why he had a train of the freaks trailing off the back not too long ago. It'd still be a viable choice if he decides to leave Tokyo behind once and for all and travel somewhere far away. But until then, leading a swarm back to the hideout every night is less than ideal. Should probably keep her eyes peeled for an electric bike we can use while charging is still an option. Ultimately, Shizuka shoots down our hero Rose offer to join forces because why wouldn't she? The last thing anyone needs in this nightmare world is to trust their life to someone who would charge unarmed into a bunch of zombies with reckless abandon. Doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the rest of his operation. As for Akira, the rejection makes him realize just how lonely his existence has become in the last couple days, inspiring him to reach out to his recently estranged best friend in hopes he might still be alive. And by some mere Miracle, he is. Although, that's likely to change very soon if he doesn't get some help. Turns out, Kensho was out seeking a little female company in the red light district when World War Z clacked off. And now he's trapped inside a brothel with roving packs of zombies patrolling the halls. Hearing this, Akira immediately suits up in his old football gear and rides down to the scene. Gotta admit, the pads would be a nice touch if combined with our magazine strat. But when a single bite to the forearm or ankle ankle is enough to turn you, they're pretty much useless by themselves. In fact, they're really just giving the Zeke something else to grab onto. And the same goes for the backpack. Just like with bullets, the best armor against zombies is not getting hit in the first place. That is to say, we should take steps to lure them all away from the building before rushing in like a maniac. To his credit, Akira does think to use a portable speaker to draw some out first, but there's still plenty left behind to get in his way during the final push. Instead, Instead of betting my life on some tiny piece of plastic, I would have set off some car alarms further up the road on both sides of the target building, and then posted up somewhere nearby to wait for them to take the bait. I mean, if Kensho could hang out next to his zombie hook for two days, he can probably hold out another 20 minutes. Yes, this is going to draw in more from outside the area of operation as well, but as long as they're all mindlessly clawing away at the cars, not stumbling around the objective, I'm totally fine with that. Lucky for Kensho, his old friend still has enough agility left from his wide receiver days to dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge his way through the crowd with relative ease. Obviously, it would have been wise to bring some kind of close quarters weapon along for when he gets inside. Although, as recent CTE studies suggest, that helmet does a great job turning your entire body into a sledgehammer. <laughs> See, that's how you lose a scholarship. Once inside, Akira manages to find his buddy without much trouble, after which the two men flee to the roof and then presumably teleport to their favorite bar and grill to plan their next move. Here, our guy brings Kensho up to speed on his slowly expanding bucket list, particularly the latest item, which is, and I quote, become a superhero who saves everyone. However, as we all know, the most important part of being a superhero is dressing 
dressing up in a ridiculous costume that establishes brand identity. And wouldn't you know it, Akira's thought of that too. As part of their plan to flee the city, Superman's bent on road tripping over to the Ibaraki Prefecture so they can swing by the Marine Paradise Aquarium and pick up one of their shark suits. I guess the idea is that if a shark can't bite through it, then zombies don't stand a chance. And while that certainly makes sense, I have a few major problems with this plan. First of all, getting the hell out of Tokyo is definitely the move. Densely populated cities in general are pretty much the worst places you could possibly be during some kind of disaster, especially if the root cause of all the chaos is the population itself. The Ibaraki Prefecture is nowhere near as populous as Tokyo, to be sure. But if the Marine Paradise Aquarium is the same as the Aqua World Aquarium in Owari, we'd be in a town of about 16,000 people, which is still a lot more potential zombies than I'd want to deal with. Of course, if the plan is just to grab the suit and leave, we could probably handle it. But let's face it, Akira's not the first person to think of that. There's nearly 3 million people in the Ibaraki Prefecture who are a lot closer to the aquarium than we are. And you know what? Fine, let them have it. A shark suit like that is going to be heavy, and it'd just be overkill anyway. All we really need is a Kevlar or thick leather racing suit, like the ones used in professional motorcycle events. A full face helmet, thick leather boots, and maybe even some welding gloves. All this stuff would be far easier to come by. And we could even up armor our kit by gluing or stitching on additional layers of leather or even canvas. Sure, it's gonna be absolutely miserable to wear in the summer, but I'd still take it over a 30 pound shark suit, especially considering we'd have to pile on weapons, ammunition, water, and so on. And finally, there's Akira's superpowers, or lack thereof. Dude's only rescued two people so far, and in both cases, it nearly cost him his life. Hell, the first time he had to be rescued himself. It'd be one thing if he had a particular set of skills he could put to use here, but unless he plans on talking them to death, he should probably work on improving his zombie killing skills a bit before trying to go pro. All this is to say, a better option would be to find a cabin in rural Akita Prefecture and spend the next three years doing push-ups and subsistence hunting until his limiter breaks. Sure, that's a hell of a lot farther away than Ibaraki, but we'll need to find a car anyway, and as long as the gas pumps are working, we might as well aim high. Whatever we decide to do, we're going to need supplies, and since Akira spent no time at all over the last few days creating any kind of survival stack, the Knight Errant and his faithful squire head on over to Don Quixote's to stock up for their journey. But just as they're about to raise the shutters, a bus full of terrified survivors crashes nearby, immediately resulting in the following sh show. <laughs> Like, I get you couldn't stay in there forever, but why on earth would you immediately get out and run straight through a horde like that? I mean, it didn't look like there were any zombies on board, and it's not like the bus was on fire or anything. Why not just hunker down and stay quiet until they eventually wander off? As for Aquaman, the sudden chaos prompts him to spring into action. Well, sort of. He basically just waves over a few of the passengers who weren't immediately eaten, and they all scurry inside the uncleared structure to right out the storm. Yeah, definitely should have brought weapons along if you were planning on looting a place like this. Just because it was shuttered doesn't mean the owner didn't invite 50 randos in to hide after they all got bitten. Luckily, no such thing seems to have occurred, although they didn't really have time to check people for bites. Now did they? With all the danger seemingly locked outside, the gang quickly gets comfortable in their new temporary shelter. And I mean, really comfortable. Alcohol definitely helped, at least for some of us. Turns out, one of the survivors happened to be Shizuka, and it seems the whole experience didn't do much to warm her icy demeanor. Gotta admit, climbing on a bus full of helpless sheeple doesn't really fit her whole I work alone and only look out for myself attitude. But apparently, they were all headed to a supposed sanctuary set up at none other than the very same Marine Paradise Aquarium Akira mentioned earlier. Still, she's not super excited about the prospect of traveling with this goober, but she's not gonna have much choice once the bus driver succumbs to his hidden bite wound and spoils Kencho's mid-flight massage. Shall we do it with this? <laughs> 
If only there were some kind of instrument Akira and Shizuka could have used to make the zombie fall over and not get back up. But as far as I know, no such thing has ever existed. Still, it would have been a courtesy to at least shout across the store and warn your friends about the zombie coming over to cop block him. Fortunately, this old junk store stocks a wide array of fireworks, which the trio used to successfully distract the freshly turned freaks while they work opening the exit. This whole experience also serves to teach us a bit more about the virus, specifically the incubation period, which, based on what happens to the flight attendants, is only a matter of minutes. Aside from that, Kensho's close encounter with the bus driver shows us these things are pretty much totally blind, and as such, completely reliant on their sense of hearing to hone in on prey. We shouldn't take this as a given for every single one until we can gather more data, but it does seem likely considering he recently turned and otherwise had functioning eyes beforehand. Of course, even without this discovery, we should have known from earlier that the shamblers are attracted to loud noises, so it probably wasn't such a good idea to run blindly out of the shutters in case our recent shenanigans pulled in a crowd. For some reason, the gang decides they can only escape by finding a working vehicle. Vehicle, even though they could have easily just shut the door behind them and taken their sweet ass time. I mean, what are the chances of finding an unlocked car with the keys left in it before the zombies shuffle on out of there and chase them down? <laughs> This one's good! Huh, apparently very good. It was literally the first one he tried. Through this stunning display of plot convenience, Akira, Kensho, and Shizuka now have exactly what they need to complete their road trip out to the aquarium. However, they clearly aren't in any hurry to get out there. Instead, breaking up the 83-mile trip over the course of two days. Why is that, you ask? Well, they've got to hit up a few more of Akira's bucket list items, like paragliding and float yoga. And while at least one of those things looks totally awesome, and I definitely stopped to do that, it kind of gives us an idea of just how serious Hero Boy is about his commitment to protecting others. Oh, sorry ma'am, I know your baby got eaten alive and stuff, but I was busy playing with sparklers. Jokes aside, their adventures really illustrate how much safer this stretch of countryside is compared to Tokyo, despite not being all that far away. I'm pretty sure they only saw two zombies the entire time, and they didn't really seem like that much of a threat. Honestly, if it were me in this situation, I'd just bag the whole shark suit pipe dream and go full van life for a while until the JSDF finally got its together. Eventually, Team Akira decides to quit screwing around and actually heads for the aquarium, only to learn the rumors about people setting up shop there are true. Only, they're not exactly rolling out the red carpet. <laughs> What, they couldn't put up a keep out sign or something before all the spike strips? Some sanctuary this turned out to be. And it only gets worse, as Akira soon awakens to find himself staring into the eyes of his former manager. You know, the one who spent the last year torturing him eight days a week. Truly, things are screwed up when you immediately assume the sight of your boss's face is a nightmare, and not the hell apocalypse scenario. Unfortunately for Akira, this is no dream. Turns out Kazuki and a few of his co-workers were out here shooting a commercial when the end of days kicked off, and through a combination of sheer determination and Stalinism, he managed to transform this once fun and magical place into a brutal authoritarian regime, wherein he and his cronies reign supreme over the pitiful wretches that wash up at his door. All in all, it's a pretty sweet racket he's got going. After leaving the infirmary, Akira finds Kensho and Shizuka, and even his former neighbors already hard at work earning their spot at the table. And what a pathetic table it is. For all their hard work, they're barely given enough to stay alive, whereas the party members get to enjoy the perks of their positions. As for Batman, he all but immediately abandons his heroic ambitions and falls right back into the same miserable existence he led before all in the name of providing his friends a safe place to work themselves to death. Freedom for protection, right? Question is, protection from what? I mean, it's hardly the road out there. You guys were literally just having the time of your lives. How about we tell this dirtbag to suck it easy and get back to actually enjoying our life for a change? Contrary to what those spike strips might suggest, no one's actually a prisoner here. All we'd have to do is repair and reinflate the tires on the Winnebago and we could leave whenever we want. And we'll definitely want to leave. Oh, that's right. You haven't met our security team yet, have you?
Okay, so let me get this straight. You guys created a sanctuary from the zombies and then deliberately went and surrounded it with fuck zombies. What world do you live in where that makes any sense at all? According to Kazuki, they help scare away bandits. But you know what else would scare away bandits? Having actual guards patrolling the gate with actual weapons. They don't even have to be guns, necessarily. Just give them something other than megaphones, so they look even the slightest bit intimidating. Fact is, these things don't care what they're chasing. Any bandits out there can simply make a ton of noise to draw them all away, and then plow right through the front gates with up-armored vehicles. I mean, that's literally what they do every time they send out a supply convoy, so it wouldn't be that hard for observers to figure out. All this rotting meat shield is going to accomplish is flooding the place with undead the day some idiot or disgruntled employee leaves the gate open. And what do you know? That day is today. Unbeknownst to everyone in the compound, an especially sneaky zomboy snuck a ride back in one of the supply trucks, thereby setting up the perfect distraction for this to happen. <laughs> See, what did I tell you? I mean, you'd think that less than two weeks into Armageddon, there wouldn't be enough normalcy bias for dudes to start unloading trucks while the zombie gate is wide open. But alas, here we are. Either way, one of the first things they should have done here is establish some kind of base-wide alert system in case something went horribly wrong, especially given their choice in security personnel. At the very least, they still have radios, right? Then again, it probably wouldn't matter anyway, since everyone inside is currently hyper-focused focused on Akira's final showdown with Kazuki. It seems his friends were finally able to get it through his head that this place really sucks, prompting Iron Man to finally hand in his five-finger resignation. Well, kinda. He really just pulls the boss man's leg out from under him, but we'll pretend he punched him instead. Either way, Akira's moment of triumph is short-lived, as the shitstorm finally makes its way to the heart of the facility. Yeah, bet they're really regretting that whole zombie security system now. Huh. <laughs> At any rate, the super best friend are able to escape with some of the other survivors. And eventually, the group manages to track down Kazuki after he bravely left them all for dead. Ceausescu, his ass. The whole situation takes a really, really, really weird turn for the worse. What was that? My god, Zombie Shark. Yeah, that certainly sucks for what's-his-name. But the good news is, sharks don't do super well out of water, so the rest of us should be fine, right? Uh, well, it turns out, not so much. Evidently, that last dude was all it needed to complete the human centipede forming in its gullet, and the results are... F ridiculous. Honestly, this is not nearly as big of a deal as everyone thinks it is. The shark isn't mind-melding with the shamblers inside it. They're just walking towards whatever they hear, which in this case happens to be everyone screaming their heads off and running away. Of course they're gonna chase you. We just need to stay quiet and try to draw the legmen back towards the tank somehow, maybe by throwing stuff into the water to create splashes. But because everyone comes completely unglued at the sight of God's mistake, the creature follows them out into the corridor, where we still could probably get the better of it. See that forklift? Someone climb inside and charge full speed at this freak show with the forks right at schnoz level. With a little luck, we can ram them right down its throat and drive it straight into the opposite wall. That said, having someone distract it so we can hit broadside would probably be a better move. The average Great White only gets up to about 2,400 pounds tops. Add in the corpses inside, and we're still only about 3,000, which should be within the tolerances of a forklift like that. All we'd have to do is put the fork center mass and lift up so the legs can no longer touch the ground. Boom, shark attack over. Ultimately, everyone's able to hold up in a supply room before anyone else can get eaten. Everyone except Kazuki, that is. So yeah, nothing of value is lost. However, beside being the do-gooder that he is, Akira refuses to let his former tormentor get ripped apart by a sharknado creature. And like any good superhero, he's He's finally got his costume. You'll be okay, Chief Kosugi. Okay, not sure how well that helmet would do while wearing goggles and a regulator, but I guess it works on land. Apparently, the designers knew this day would come. What Akira fails to realize, however, is that the shark doesn't actually need to bite through the material to kill him. A great white's bite force alone would be more than enough to break every bone in his body. Luckily, he won't have to do this alone, as Kensho soon takes over with the forklift freeing up the Blue Ranger to go save Kazuki once again after he let the biters in. 
super suit or not, you can't actually get rid of the zombies if you don't get rid of the zombies. Where's your flaming sword of justice, bro? At the very least, grab one of those thick wooden fence posts and start swinging away. <laughs> Even those tables and chairs lying around would let you create distance and shove them into the water without getting too close. It's like the dude's learned nothing from literally every single encounter he's had with the undead so far. Fortunately, just like back at the grocery store, Shizuka's here to bail his ass out at the last second. <laughs> Yeah, might have been a better idea to simply toss those things into the corner so everyone could run away, but at least they're all gone for good. As for the land shark, turns out Akira lying flat on his back did a better job at keeping it at bay than Kensho could with his forklift. So now we'll have to find a way to deal with that as well. Honestly, with all the zombies running at the bottom of the shark tank, I'd probably just GTFO and leave it here for some other band of survivors to deal with later. But because Kazuki got knocked out cold, things aren't quite that simple. Or are they? While Blue Falcon's busy fooling around with Bruce, Kensho and Shizuka could carry the unconscious man to safety. Once that's taken care of, Akira can quit screwing around and leave this thing for someone else to deal with. Well, that's assuming he can get his wrist free. But eventually, the shark is bound to either let him go or take a second grip and bite him in half at the waist. Either way, we won't have to worry about it anymore. Instead, Kensho and Shizuka decide to solve this absurd predicament with an even more absurd solution. I guess it only makes sense. Using the D-cell batteries from Kazuki's flashlight, she tapes them together to form a sort of stun pack thing, citing the fact sharks use electric impulses to hunt. As evidence, the minuscule amount of charge will cause it to f explode or whatever. All she needs now is a way to get it into Akira's steel-clad hands, and wouldn't you know it, Kensho happens to be the very second-string quarterback who blew their big college game with his crushing indecisiveness. Thankfully, he's grown a lot as an athlete during this ordeal. I'm not quite sure how that could be, but he can at least complete a pass now. And that just leaves the snoot boop. <laughs> I'm not even gonna say it. And with that, Akira and his friends are finally free to resume their cross-country road trip and enjoy the apocalypse while it lasts. Kazuki, on the other hand, is left to rot in what's left of his fortress, where he'll almost be killed trying to round up another group of zombies to guard the front gate. In the end, all of our main characters survived, even Akira despite his best efforts. However, had they set more practical objectives from the very beginning and loaded up on food, water, weapons, and camp gear before leaving Tokyo, they could have easily maintained a comfortable existence out on the road without feeling the need to join some dumbass survival commune. For that reason, I think the ZOM 100 was beat. Moral of the story, don't surround your base with zombies.